Hi everybody, this is, I hope, uh, Psych 598E, uh, Evolutionary Psychology. So, uh, today I'm going to just record the lecture and uh, give you a link to it. Uh, I know this isn't ideal for a graduate class. I realize that, and I apologize to Crystal. Crystal will have her presentation up on Canvas uh, very soon, uh, I'm sure. Um, so, of course, I want the graduate class to be interactive. I've heard bad things about um, the, the WebEx, and so I think we're going to try and get Zoom set up for next time. So I'm going to do my best to get Zoom set up for next time. And then we'll just, I'll do my presentation at the regular class time next time uh, is the idea. I uh, appreciate you being um, uh, patient during this process. I know none of us likes this very much, so we're just going to do the best we can. Now for the lecture uh, this week, let me remind you that my email address is ecooper at iastate.edu. If you got any questions uh, about this, this lecture, what I'd recommend is maybe note the time uh, on the video when you had the question uh, in your answer or in your question and then just email me what your question is and I'll do my best to answer it. Like I said, I hope next time we'll have things set up so that we can be more interactive during the class. We're just going to make do for tonight. Well, if you remember what I was uh, discussing last time was I was discussing happiness and I know it has been uh, it has been quite a while since we had that lecture we due to spring break and so I just wanted to uh, review a little bit about what we talked about last time because uh, the rest of the lecture won't make sense if you don't remember uh, this stuff so if you remember what we were talking about we were talking about Burnham and and Phelan's short-term reward theory of happiness. And so what they're uh, concerned with is uh, if you had uh, an animal that was set up to survive and reproduce, what sorts of things would you want to reward and how would you want to reward them in the nervous system of this animal? And so what they said was, essentially, I, I would say there are four elements to their theory. First element is that the happiness, happiness module has been set up to briefly, briefly reward uh, progress. So uh, if you, say, get a raise at work, that does make you happy when you get the raise, and that uh, encourages you or rewards you to encourage to strive further to get a reward next time. But if you were happy forever once you showed some progress, well, then you wouldn't show any more progress. And so the idea is that there may have been some animals once upon a time that were like that. When they got enough food for the day, they just stopped uh, trying to gather any more food. But uh, when the famines came, they all died off, and it was only the animals that weren't satisfied with anything for very long that uh, survived. And so that's why the happiness module has been set up to briefly reward progress. It's also the happiness module has been set up to briefly punish regress. So when something bad happens to you, you break your leg or you lose a loved one, you're going to be sad for a while. But eventually the sadness will fade and then you'll be happy again. It wouldn't be wise to set up an animal to be debilitated by unhappiness forever uh, when something bad happens. So when something bad happens, we're sad for a while, but we recover from that as well. Uh, third element was the happiness module has been set up to reward progress and punish regress rather than to reward our absolute level of resources. Uh, so what I mean by that is it's not how much money you have in the bank that determines how happy you are. Rather, it is uh, whether you're shown, showing progress for a particular day. 
And so I gave the example of a rich man and a poor man, and the rich man um, doesn't get a raise on one particular day. The poor man does. Well, the poor man's going to be happier than the rich man that day because he's the one who's shown progress, even though the rich man actually made more money that day. So it's not really the absolute level of resources that you have in the bank that you're being rewarded for. It's whether you're showing progress or uh, regress. And then to decide whether you're showing a progress or regress, the happiness module uses the equation happiness equals outcome minus expectations. It would be nice if that uh, would have stayed on the same line, but you get the idea. Outcome minus expectations. So you take what you expect to achieve in, uh, in a particular situation and you compare that to what you actually achieve. If the outcome is way better than what you expected to happen, well then you're going to be happy because it appears that you're showing progress. If on the other hand the expectations are much uh, worse than uh, what you expected, uh, the outcome is worse than your expectations rather, uh, well, then you're going to be unhappy, and the more that it uh, is below your expectations, well, the more unhappy you're going to be. All right, so that's the basic idea of the happiness mechanism set up to uh, reward progress briefly, punish regress briefly, rewards progress and regress rather than your absolute level of resources, and then happiness equals outcome minus expectations. Okay, well this is kind of maybe the most important part of the lecture then, given that uh, can you actually engineer your life in order to be a happier person? So advice from uh, evolutionary theory, theory uh, for increasing happiness. Advice from evolutionary theory for increasing happiness. Let's put an underline under that. Okay. Well, uh, why is it doing that? Bless your heart. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. What I wanted to go through is there's a number of things that you can actually do to engineer your life to make your life and other lives uh, happier. Uh, and so let's talk about uh, each of them based on the Burnham and Phelan happiness uh, theory. So, first piece of advice would be buy small gifts for friends and relatives that are not tied to holidays. It's not right, holidays or birthdays. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, uh, one time I used to buy my brother uh, a gift on his birthday, usually about a $50 gift on his birthday and about a $50 gift at Christmas, and so I'd spend $100 a year on gifts for my brother. Well, I could actually, if I wanted to, spend that same $100 a year and make him happier if I were to um, give him gifts that weren't tied to his birthday or Christmas. See, the idea is that he expects to get a gift from me on his birthday and he expects to get a gift from me at Christmas. And so, his, uh, if happiness is outcome minus expectations, I'm not making him very happy when he gets those gifts because he expects to get uh, a $50 gift from me on his birthday and Christmas. When he gets one, well, that's just what he expected, so happiness isn't, uh, isn't greater or less because of that. On the other hand, now what I do is I give him a $25 gift at Christmas. I give him a $25 gift on his birthday. And then at two randomly selected dates during the year, I send him two other $25 gifts. Like I remember, uh, it was a few months ago, uh, I saw on Amazon they had some huge box of over Redenbacher popcorn for like $20. It was an incredible deal. And so I just said, wow, I'm going to send that to my brother. So I bought the, the box of over Redenbacher popcorn, sent it to my brother, on a day that had nothing to do with his birthday or uh, his, his Christmas, and he didn't expect a present on that day. So it made him way happier to get this box of Orville Redenbacher popcorn out of the blue that he didn't expect. Now the outcome is much greater than his expectations for that day. 
And so essentially I'm spending the same amount of money on gifts for him that I used to, but um, he's actually happier than when I used to just uh, spend gifts on his Christmas and his birthday. I remember when I was in college, uh, I was studying for this chemistry test, and I was really worried about it, and it was obvious I was really worried about it. And uh, it was at night, night test, and I came back from the test to my dorm room, and my roommate had uh, bought me a pizza and put it on my desk, and he had a little note on it, and he said, I know you are really worried about this test, and I thought that if I bought you a pizza, that would make you happy. That guy's my hero. I'm going to remember him the rest of my life because he did that, because I certainly didn't expect to get uh, uh, something like that, uh, and so it really surprised my expectations, and so that made me very happy. And so that's kind of the, the take-home message from this, is people like good surprises. If you want to make somebody happy, what you should do is give them a good surprise, because it... Uh, it um, surprises their expectations. So, I'm going to say this makes people happier because it surprises their expectations. Surprises their expectations. Okay. Second piece of advice is you should change activities in your exercise program when your performance starts to plateau. You will be happier uh, when you are showing progress at an activity. All right, let me move that up. Okay. You should change activities in your exercise program. Your performance starts to plateau. You'll be happier when you're showing progress at, at an activity. Okay, well, uh, here's what I mean by this. I think a lot of us have trouble uh, staying on an exercise program. And if you first start, say, like running, for example, uh, after you haven't been running for a while, uh, you know, you show progress pretty rapidly. The first time you run, it's usually pretty miserable, but it gets better the next time and better the next time. And so you show progress pretty rapidly when you first start some kind of exercise program. But eventually you're going to reach a point where it becomes harder to show progress. And that's the point where many people get bored and they drop out. And so the idea is to maintain your exercise program. What you want to do is if you reach the point where you're stopping to plateau at a particular activity, well, what you want to do is change activities to something else, maybe bicycling instead of running, so that it still gives you that sense of progress and you'll stick with it. And so the idea is that when people become unhappy, it's when they aren't showing progress, and so that's why a lot of people skip out on their exercise program. So that's one thing to do to maybe uh, stick with the exercise program. Okay, uh, third thing. On your to-do lists, divide jobs into explicit small chunks that will allow you to experience progress. On your to-do list, divide jobs into explicit small chunks that will allow you to experience progress. Okay, so I know when I was working on my dissertation, uh, I would have like a list of things I was going to do that day, and one of them was I would just list uh, work on dissertation and have a block of time when I was going to do that. Well, I never did uh, do much work during those periods, and what would have been better for me is to actually show myself accomplishing some goals so I can show some progress. And so what I should have done was, uh, I should have said, finish the introduction section to experiment one. That's what I want to accomplish during this time period. 
uh, finish the method section of experiment one during the next time period and so forth. By having small chunks of a bigger job, that allows you to show progress and keeps you motivated. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Dave Ramsey. He's kind of a financial guru, and his big thing is that if you're in debt, uh, oh, that should be you should concentrate on getting out of debt and essentially live in poverty until your debt's paid off. And what he suggests is not with starting with your highest interest rate debt but rather starting to pay off your smallest debt first. So you put extra payments towards your smallest debt. When you pay if it off, you roll that payment into your next biggest debt and so forth. And even though it seems maybe irrational, uh, it keeps people motivated to do it that way because they can see their debts dropping away, and so they feel like they're making progress, and it's motivating, and so they can keep paying off their debts. So the idea is if you have a little uh, bit of small chunks and you set your goals to be I'm going to accomplish this small chunk rather than some sort of big amorphous thing like work on the dissertation, that is eventually going to show uh, more progress and you're going to be happier. All right, number four, one of the most important ones, I think. Under promise overperform. Under promise, overperform. Okay, what I mean by that is, let's say that you're running late for an appointment, uh, your friend is already there at the place where you're supposed to meet them, and you think you're going to be about 20 minutes late. So, when you call up your friend, should you say, hi, I'm on my way, uh, I think I'm going to be about 20 minutes late, well, no. I would say you ought to tell your friend, I'm going to be 30 minutes late. And so you set up the expectation that you're going to be 30 minutes late. And then we actually arrive in 20 minutes, your friend's going to be happy because uh, you uh, exceeded their expectations. They expected you to be 10 minutes later. On the other hand, had you been so silly as to tell them that you were going to be there in 10 minutes when it's actually it was going to take 20 that's going to make them unhappy because you've set up their expectations for 10 minutes and then you uh, came in 20 minutes. And so uh, the same 20 minute late can be something that makes people happy or makes them unhappy depending on how you set up their expectations. And so that's something to remember whenever you're on the job. To under promise for your boss, tell your boss that this thing is going to take you 10 days to complete that project. And then overperform, get it done in seven days, and then your boss is going to be loving you because you have exceeded his expectations. All right, next one, number five. Uh, laying around accomplishing nothing is unlikely to make you happy. Happiness comes from achieving goals. Happiness comes from achieving goals. So, you know, if you imagine maybe what your ideal life would be like if you won the lottery, uh, you might uh, imagine uh, I'd get up around noon and I'd go and maybe watch some TV and then hang out at the beach for a while and, uh, you know, go to the bar. So essentially like you're on a permanently permanent vacation. Uh, well, uh, that does sound nice, but I think what you'll find is that you're going to be unhappy after a while because you aren't really showing any progress in your life. You're not accomplishing any goals. They did this social psych study where they had a, a beeper that they would give people, uh, and it would beep uh, at various random points during the day. And what people were supposed to do when they heard the beep is they were required to write down what they were doing and to rate how happy they were at the time that they were doing it. And believe it or not, people actually uh, reported the most happiness when they were at work. And the reason was is when they reported they were happy at work is when they were moving forward, accomplishing a goal, uh, working like, uh, you know, using their capabilities and not having a lot of uh, barriers in their way. I'm sure we've all had this experience. The social psychologist called it flow 
where you're not really paying attention to the time and you're getting a lot accomplished and you're very satisfied while you're doing this, that is the sort of thing that seemed to make people happy. So it's really accomplishing goals uh, that makes people happy. Now, I don't know about you. I play uh, a lot of these RPG uh, video games. There's essentially Dungeons and Dragons on the computer. These are games for people so nerdy that other nerds refuse to play real Dungeons and Dragons with them, and uh, the people may have to for play on the computer. So I love these games. Uh, I play them quite a bit. And so what happens in these games is there's these low-level tasks, or like creatures that aren't very dangerous that you have to kill, and uh, as part of that you get experience points for killing them. And if you accumulate enough experience points, that's when you, what they call, level up. You get, uh, maybe you were an 8th level fighter, and now you've killed enough, you're going to be a ninth level fighter. And what happens is you get, like, new powers and things uh, when you level up. And that's where the big rush of happiness comes, is when you see your character. He's been, you know, fighting these low-level creatures, like the, the evil moth creatures. And then, uh, after enough of fighting of the Renoth creatures, well, you uh, level up and you get all these new powers. And you feel like, hey, I deserve these new powers. I just spent the last three hours destroying the dangerous moth creatures. Um, and so you're happy because you've got all these new powers. Well, what wouldn't make you happy is you can find cheat codes for a lot of these games that will give your character like a billion experience points at the start of the game, so the character starts with like all the powers and all the spells and everything else, so they're super-powered character. Well, that doesn't make the game very fun at all. Of course, it's very easy to defeat all the uh, monsters, particularly the ones at the early levels, if you got all the experience points, but you didn't earn those experience points, and of course, uh, with all the powers you have, it's trivially easy to kill all these monsters, and so uh, it's not a fun game. Then The fun comes from showing progress, and so uh, in general, that's, uh, that's progress is intimately tied to happiness. If you got a case where you can't show progress, or a situation where you aren't showing progress, that's a situation where it's pretty much impossible to be happy. Okay, number six. A career with advancement opportunities will make you happier than a better paying job with no chance of promotion. Okay, again, because happiness is intimately tied with progress, you've got to think about when you're choosing a, a job, what, what kind of job is going to allow you to show the most progress. So uh, uh, the example I give to the undergraduates is, say hypothetically, you were offered the, uh, to be the head of the Target store in town uh, when you graduate. And that's a really good job. That's like $150,000 a year to be the head of a Target store. And so if you get out of college and you've got a job like that, of course, all your friends are going to be jealous. You'll be able to go on fancy vacations that they won't be able to do and afford a big house right away. Uh, so you'll be happy then, but here's the problem. Let's say for whatever reason, uh, the next move up would be to corporate headquarters, which would require you to move. And because of your situation, for whatever reason, you can't move. Maybe your spouse has a, a job they can't move from. So essentially, this job as the head of the target, that's going to be your job the rest of your life. For the next 40 years, you're going to be head of this target store. Well, even though that's a very high-paying job, I think somebody who takes a job like that is going to be a total burnout uh, after 10 years. Because the person will probably see some cost of living increases, so your salary will keep up with inflation. But what will probably not happen is you will never see like a big increase in your standard of living. You'll never see uh, an increase in your job duties or responsibilities. Essentially, you'll be doing the same thing the last day of your job that you were doing the first day of your job, even though you are very well compensated. So I think a person like that's going to be very burned out at their job. They're not going to be showing any progress, and they're going to be unhappy. 
I think somebody else who took a job that allows them to show progress and have accomplishments and see big changes in their material success, that person is actually going to be way happier with their job than somebody whose job does not allow them any opportunities to show advancement. And so even if somebody made less money over the course of their career, I think if they have a job that's going to allow them to show advancement, that's going to make them a lot happier than one that doesn't. Okay, well that's all I had to say about happiness. Uh, I think this is a really important topic. Uh, when I, um, I like uh, give talks sometimes, the Rotary Club will ask me to give a talk. It's usually a shortened version uh, of the talk I just gave you. And uh, I think uh, you can also incorporate that. I incorporate a shortened version into Psych 101 as well. So I really think this is the sort of thing that we uh, psychologists should be educating other people about. All right, well, that's it for uh, happiness. And now I want to go on to the uh, next topic. I thought today I would talk about laughter is what I talk about, laughter. Okay? And people sometimes ask me, like, what's, what's fi what makes something funny? Well, no, not humor. Uh, really, I'm talking about laughter. Laughter is a, I guess, prosodic feature of speech. It's something that... Um, Primates do, uh, chimpanzees laugh as well, and the question is, what's going on with laughter? Sometimes we laugh in response to humor, but we laugh other times as well. Well, I want to talk about the, this book by Robert Provine, published in 2000, uh, called Laughter, a, a uh, Cyan... Scientific investigation. Uh, stop it. Okay. Uh, so this is really the first attempt to do a scientific study of uh, laughter. And so Provine's goal when he uh, set out to write this book was to figure out, you know, when people laugh and why people laugh. And so the first thing he did was uh, he got some videos, uh, DVDs, of stand-up comedians, and he'd have his subjects come into a room, and they'd sit down, and uh, he'd show these videos, and then he was going to write down when they laughed and what they laughed at. But what they found is that the vast majority of the subjects in that situation never laughed at all, and uh, the ones who did managed only a short chuckle or two. Uh, so watching a stand-up comedy all alone in a room does not appear to be a good stimulus for producing laughter. Which leads to the first question, why do people laugh? <coughs> well, one thing that uh, Provine found was that most laughs in the real world are not made in response to humor. Uh, that is, it's far more common, uh, he found, uh, for people to laugh as kind of a punctuation, the prosodic feature of speech, to kind of lighten the mood. So uh, people would say things like, uh, must be nice, <laughs> or can I join you? <laughs> uh, with a little laugh at the end. Uh, to just kind of uh, lighten the mood, essentially. And so uh, what he found was that uh, people didn't usually, when they laugh, it wasn't usually in response to humor. So what he did was he had 72 subjects keep a laugh log, a little notebook where they would record every time they laughed, the time, uh, the number of people who were with them, and what they had laughed at. And the most striking finding is there's a big difference in how much people laugh when they're in the presence of others as opposed to when they're alone. Uh, Provine found that people laugh uh, 30 times as frequently uh, when, in the, when in the presence of others as when they are alone, alone, alone. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're, what that suggests is it's some kind of social signal 
we're actually conveying some kind of information to other people when we laugh. And we'll discuss evidence about what kind of information we are conveying uh, when we laugh uh, in, a, in a little while here. But one of the things is that laughter in, in isolation appears to be just kind of a waste of energy. We're trying to communicate something to other people when we laugh. He found that uh, people were only four times more likely to talk when in the presence of other people and six times more likely to smile. So really, laughter appears to be more of a social signal even than talking uh, and smiling are. Now, one of the big findings is there are huge sex differences uh, in a laughing behavior. And he has this table in the book that I want to show you here, if I can find it, uh, where what he did was he, uh, uh, he recorded conversations between two people, including all possible sex combinations, so male, male, female, female, male, female, and female, male. And so he has, when somebody laughed, he, he would record if the speaker laughed, and then if the audience laughed, and then the number of laughs, uh, total laughs that they had during the conversation. And so there are some interesting patterns here if you look at this. So here are the, uh, I would say the, the principal principal findings of the laugh study. Uh, I would say uh, first is that women laugh more than men. Okay, you can see, uh, uh, yeah, here's the female, female, uh, at least the speaker is higher. Now the audience laugh isn't that much higher. But here, the, the audience laughter is higher there, and the speaker laughter is higher there. So, in almost all cases, women are laughing more than men. Uh, but men get more laughs than women. Men get more laughs than women. Uh, next finding, two women together laugh about twice as often as any other grouping. So you can see two women, there are 502 laughs when the female and female are talking. The female is talking, the male is the speaker, is less than half of that. So really the others are about half of what this one is. Uh, so two women laughing together laugh a lot. I know uh, I was, uh, uh, for a while, it was just uh, the cognitive area consisted of me and Dr. Dark and Dr. Cleary. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Morris, Allison Morris. So it was three females and just me. And every time we had a uh, area meeting, oh my God, it was like a seventh grade slumber party, I swear. Too much estrogen in the room for me. So women get in and they get together, laugh a whole lot more than men when they get together. Uh, males laugh um, more in the presence of of other men than in the presence of women. Uh, yeah, you can see that here. So male and male, they laugh more, but when the female and female, female and male configurations, they have the least amount of laughter. So the same sex configurations have more laughter than the opposite sex. And then the only instance in which the audience laughs more than right, the audience laughs more than the speaker is when a man is the speaker and the woman is the audience. The only instance in which the audience laughs more than the speaker is when the man is the speaker and the woman is the audience. So, we laugh at ourselves more. We think we're funnier than other people do. So you can see always the speaker is laughing more than the audience in every case. 
except where the male is the speaker and the female is the audience here. So in every other case, the speaker is laughing at themselves more than uh, the um, uh, audience is. Now, what is the deal with uh, women um, not laughing or laughing more than men and men not laughing very much at women? And so it suggests why most comedians and your class clowns tend to be men rather than women. It's hard for women to get laughs from men. And we'll talk about why that might be uh, a little later. We're going to talk about uh, what you might be conveying with laughter. But I think this data is kind of interesting. Now, is this some sort of cultural effect, or is there an evolutionary bias to the fact that um, um, men don't laugh to women as much? Uh, well, it's hard to say. I don't think this has been done cross-culturally with a, a chart like this. Uh, but they have done uh, studies, developmental studies, where they took at five-year-olds they looked at girls when they were in a mixed sex group or watching cartoons with a group of boys and they looked at um, uh, boys laughter when they were with girls and also when they were with the same sex group. The finding was that girls laughed more if they were in a group of boys than if it was just another group of girls alone. Girls would almost always reciprocate if the boys started laughing to the cartoon but it was uncommon for a boy to start laughing if the girl started. So if there is some sort of cultural effect on this behavior, it appears to appear uh, very early in development. Now, okay, so let's move this out of the way. Uh, so the sex differences here in laughter suggest there might uh, be some kind of sexually selected characteristic here. And so one thing that Provine did was he did an analysis of personal ads looking for seeing if people wanted somebody funny or saying that they were funny. And so he, he studied uh, over 3,000, it was about 3,700 personal ads in 1996. What he found was uh, in personal ads, women were twice as likely to say they wanted a mate that could make them laugh than to mention they were funny themselves. Yeah, sorry. They were funny themselves. Okay. Men showed the opposite pattern. Men show the opposite pattern. So, just kind of like any sexually selected characteristic, this is kind of what we'd expect. So we talked about how uh, for language, for example, which appears to be at least partially a, select, a sexually selected characteristic, men have larger vocabularies uh, and talk more, write more books, while women are better at understanding speech and are more likely to read books. Well, this is the similar thing. Men have evolved to display humor is the idea, and women have evolved to appreciate the humor. And so humor may well be uh, a sexually selected characteristic, makes sense, uh, probably reveals uh, social intelligence or something on the part of the person if they're able to come up with uh, funny things to say. So this, the data we have on the laughter do appear to be consistent with the idea that humor, being humorous, is a sexually selected characteristic. Men have evolved to display the characteristic, and women have evolved to appreciate the characteristic. Now, they did uh, a study in Germany where they recorded the conversations of heterosexual couples who were on the date for the first time, and uh, they uh, so they recorded the conversations because they could get the laughter uh, information from that. They were really just looking at laughing behavior. And then they also asked the participants in the date to rate how interested they would be in having a second date with that person. Uh, what they found was the more the woman laughs during a first date, the more both the woman and the man wanted a second date. The 
amount. The man laughs was unrelated to how interested either party was in a second date. Okay, the more the woman laughs during a first date, the more both the woman and the man wanted a second date. The amount the man laughs was unrelated to how interested either party was in a second date. Uh, and so uh, it appears that if the woman is laughing a lot, that's going to be a signal that she likes the man. We'll talk more about what she might be signaling by doing that later on. The interesting thing was, now women have more of a propensity to laugh uh, than men do. Uh, and so the one finding, maybe the most interesting finding was, if it was the case that the man laughed more than the woman during the date, then neither one ever wanted a second date. So that's a really bad sign if the man is laughing more than the woman during the course of the date. That means the woman probably doesn't like him at all. So ladies, there's some way you could get rid of a guy who's been pestering you that you're not that interested in, uh, agree to a date with him, but then uh, don't laugh at all during the date, and probably he won't be very interested in seeing you again. Well, we're going to come back to this. I think there might be uh, something that's being signaled. Uh, the female is signaling to the male when she laughs a lot at his jokes. Uh, we'll come back to this and try and provide like a fully integrated uh, theory of humor uh, a little bit later on. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, the next uh, thing that he looked at, Provine looked at in his book on laughter. And that was the relation, uh, uh, relation, relation of humor to social dominance. Relation of humor to social dominance. So let's put an underline under that. Okay. Well, uh, there was a study done by the sociologist Rose Croeser. Uh, she did a a study at a hospital and there were kind of three ranks within this hospital uh, that would and they'd have these staff meetings and she would pay attention to like um, who laughed at who during these staff meetings so the three ranks of people who would attend these staff meetings at the hospital there were senior doctors uh, they were people who completed uh, all their residency requirements and things uh, and then junior doctors, and these were doctors who were doing their residency at the hospital. And then there was paramedical staff, and these were like the paramedics and the social workers that worked at the hospital. And what she did was she counted the number of jokes uh, that each group made at the expense of the others during the course of this meeting. And so let me show you the data and what she found. Uh, I don't know why I did that. But, uh, you know, let's go to fix that. Okay. This too. Okay. So what we can see is the senior staff is definitely making uh, the most jokes. The junior staff, the next most jokes. And then the paramedics, almost uh, uh, no jokes at all. What they found was if a joke was made at the expense of somebody who was at the meeting, uh, let's get this down, um, when making jokes about other staff members, the joke was almost always made by a higher status member uh, at the expense lower status member uh, and so it would go senior staff would make fun of junior staff and paramedicals junior staff would make fun of paramedicals but it would never go the other way the interesting thing was that it was not the senior staff that was talking most at those meetings actually the junior staff talked the most but the senior staff made the most jokes so the idea is that uh, humor is a way to kind of uh, establish a dominance hierarchy. What happens is that the people who are high in the dominance hierarchy, they make jokes, uh, and then the people lower in the dominance hierarchy, uh, I'm sorry about that, there we go, 
people you know, lower in the diet dominance hierarchy, they laugh at the jokes the senior members have made, but it never goes the other way. That's a way of indicating where you are in the status hierarchy is who can you make jokes about. Now, he also talked about, uh, give, this is anecdotal evidence uh, that Provine uh, talked about in his book, uh, but uh, this was a radio show he used to listen to in Baltimore. He's a professor at Johns Hopkins. And there's a radio show uh, produced locally in Baltimore, a classical music show, where the host was a, a female host, and she interviewed on her show mostly male classical musicians and then had them perform on the show. And there were kind of three classes of musicians that she would have. Uh, she'd have like local performers who hadn't recorded or anything yet, but they were uh, making music locally on the classical music scene. Uh, they had uh, sort of nationally famous people who had recorded but weren't like super famous unless you really knew classical music, you wouldn't know them. Uh, and then people like, and then she had uh, internationally famous people like Yo-Yo Ma and Pavarotti on her show uh, as well. And what she found, uh, and this is very anecdotal, what he found is uh, the female host would almost never laugh uh, when she was discussing uh, things with uh, a local musician. She laughed uh, a fair amount when uh, it was a uh, national musician. And then she'd just giggle like a ninny when it was somebody who's super, super famous there. And so the idea is that there's some sort of um, dominance relationship with laughter, that we laugh at higher status people uh, more than uh, lower, well, lower status people. Uh, they've seen the same thing with, among Hindus when a lower caste member and a higher caste member speak, and this doesn't matter what the, their sex is. The lower caste member uh, laughs a lot more than the higher caste member. Again, this all suggests that laughter is some sort of signal of where you are in the dominance hierarchy. What's supposed to happen is that lower status people laugh at the jokes of higher status people to show that they have some solidarity with them. All right, so that's going to be kind of uh, the second uh, um, leg in our theory, uh, evolutionary theory of laughter. So now let's deal with uh, the next question is, is laughter under conscious control? Can we laugh when we want to? So I used to, I wish uh, we were in class because if we were in class I would try this demo. I just point at somebody in class and ask them to laugh for me. And what you'll get, the funny thing I think is, a lot of times when I do it, they'll giggle that, uh, give me a genuine giggle that I ask them to do it. But then when they actually try to laugh, it sounds really, really forced. It does not sound like a natural laugh, that they're genuinely laughing. And so that appears to be one of the more important aspects of laughter. Uh, conscious attempts at laughing tend to sound forced. So if you really don't feel like laughing and you try and laugh anyway, people are going to know you're faking it, that you didn't really want to uh, laugh. Now, uh, I've said that, but uh, the threshold for laughing, uh, however, uh, appears to have some degree of conscious control. Uh, that is, uh, you can decide how funny something has to be before you're going to laugh at it. That does appear to be under control. There was an old TV show it was on when I was in high school. It was called Make Me Laugh. Uh, and I think they did an update not too long ago with uh, Howie Mandel as the host. But uh, Bobby Van was the host of the show uh, when it was on when I was in high school. And what it was was they'd have a contestant come on and they'd have some kind of stand-up comic um, do their bit. And the person was not supposed to laugh. And if they laughed uh, during the stand-up comic, then uh, they didn't get a prize. But if they managed to wait, make it all the way through, then they got some sort of prize. Now, this is not, like, really um, that hard to do. 
Uh, you, all you have to do if you don't want to laugh is just think of something that makes you really, really angry and you're not going to laugh. So uh, you can, most people, you have to be a real giggler not to be able to do that. So what that suggests is, yes, you do have conscious control over your laughter. But what you're going to find out is, uh, you know, if you're in a situation like with you're out with your friends, you're going to have with your thresholds going to be way lower for deciding when to laugh than if you're out with strangers, probably. So, yes, we do have a uh, threshold for deciding how funny something has to be before we laugh at it, even though we uh, can't really uh, consciously make ourselves laugh and make it sound convincing. So that's going to be important for the evolutionary purpose of laughter. Well, uh, Provine himself doesn't actually uh, try to connect all the dots here and come up with an overall unified theory of laughter, but that's what I'm going to try and do now is come up with an uh, overall uh, theory of laughter here. So here is my evolutionary explanation for laughter, uh, Cooper 2020. Okay, uh, so what I would say is let's put an underline under this. Laughter. I don't want to underline under that. Laughter. is used in social situations to display dominance relationships and solidarity. A lower status person sets the laughter threshold low in the presence of a higher status person whose favor is desired. Okay, so the idea is you've got a higher status person. Let's say when you're interviewing for graduate school might be a good example and you wanted to impress your potential uh, graduate advisor. The idea is that even if he tells kind of lame jokes, you probably want to laugh at them. And so what a lower status person will do is to set their threshold low so that any joke this guy whose favor I want uh, tells, I'm going to probably laugh at. Now, the idea is this is a good way to signal that you like this higher status person if you're a lower status person. Laughter is an honest signal of solidarity with the higher status person because it is easy to detect if the laughter is faked. So if you're the highest status person, you want to know if this lower status person is going to be loyal to you, this is a good way of finding out. And so the person is setting their threshold low, they're laughing at your lame jokes, and their laughter sounds genuine. Well, that means that the person is signaling to you, yes, I agree, you are a highest status person. That's why I've set my threshold for laughing at your jokes very low. And I genuinely like you because that, that is why I have set my uh, threshold so low. On the other hand, if you're kind of trying to curry this person's favor, but you don't genuinely like them, if you actually think they're kind of lame, well, then your laughter is going to sound forced. And the higher status person is going to say, I don't think I want to mentor this lower status person. I don't know if I can trust them. They're faking that they like me when they really don't like me. All right, now let's go back. So that kind of explains some of the, the status effects that we got with the laughter data. Uh, let's talk about some of the effects we got with uh, males and females. So, um, because females 
wish to mate with high status males, genuine laughter on the part of a female is a reliable cue that she regards her male companion as being of high status and is attempting to gain his favor. Okay, you remember we looked at the preferences that uh, males and females had for mates, and one of the universal preferences is females care more about the status of their mate than males do. So, if you were a female and you wanted to attract this particular male and you agreed that he was high status, well, that explains why females laugh a lot more uh, to males than males do to females. When the female laughs at the male's jokes, she's indicating to him, yes, I consider you to be of high status, and I like you, and so this encourages him to maybe ask for another date. If, on the other hand, the male is laughing more than the female, remember that was the case where nobody wanted another date, well, that indicates that the male probably thinks that the female's of higher status than him, Female's got to be thinking, oh, this guy's got to be of low status because he's laughing at a ninny to me. That means he regards himself as being lower on the status hierarchy than I am, so I can do better than this guy. And so females usually want to move up, uh, presumably on the status uh, hierarchy market. Uh, males don't care so much about that. And so that's why it's a really good sign on a date if the ma female's laughing a lot at the male's jokes. But it's a really bad sign if the male is laughing more at the female's jokes than the male's jokes. Uh, so, yeah, essentially, let's add this. Sim. Sim. All right, we're having a little trouble. Similarly, because women laugh more than men, if the male in the couple is laughing more than the female, the, that's interesting spelling, female, it is a very good sign that she regards, regrets, regards him as having too low a status to be considered as a mate. Sorry, let me move that up. Similarly, because women laugh more than men, if the male in a couple is laughing more than the female, it's a very good sign that she regards him as having too low a status to be considered as a mate. So, I loved my theory. I thought it was great. Laughter indicates a social dominance, the fact that you can uh, change your threshold, for uh, how much you laugh at something um, means that it's going to be an honest signal for that because you can tell when it's being faked. That allows the higher status person to see is the lower status person actually changing their threshold because they like me or are they trying to fakey like me. So I presented this to my undergraduate classes and then they had a lot of fun tearing into it and trying to falsify it. Most specifically, let's go back to our laugh data here. I don't think my theory can account for why two women together laugh the most. That doesn't seem to make any sense at all. I would expect that same-sex couples would laugh the least. Now maybe, I don't know, maybe there's just a lower threshold for the female to laugh so that this relationship works where the female, and the female laughs more than the male. That's a good sign. I don't know. But, yeah, that is really a problem for my theory. I would agree. It really does not explain why female versus female uh, laughs the most. So maybe you got a, a good idea on that. Well, uh, without a class here asking to ask questions to and ask me questions, this went a lot faster than I thought. Uh, expected 
Uh, usually those two lectures would take like an hour and 20 minutes or so, but we got through both of them in an hour. So, uh, like I said, uh, I am going to try and get Zoom working for the next lecture. So, at the next lecture, we will try to all use Zoom at 610 uh, on March 30th, a week from today at 610 p.m. We're all going to try and use Zoom, and I will try to get some directions out to you about how to use Zoom. I'm going to work with uh, uh, Charles and uh, Xander to get that working. So. Uh, look for some announcements on the Canvas site. Okay, bye-bye.